Hello and welcome back to the Reaper. So we've got another educational video. We're going to look at jet engines. If you look on YouTube, there are literally thousands of videos explaining jet engines, how they work, what's their purpose, blah, 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 blah. And they can do a much better job than we can. Uh, but what we're really interested in is explaining the jet engine and how it affects us in DCS. So we've got a lot of viewers that are aviation enthusiasts and they already know a lot about jet engines, possibly more than us which is fine, in this case you're probably not interested. We've also got a lot of viewers that are not aviation enthusiasts and we want to turn them into aviation enthusiasts. So our job today is to explain, hopefully to the layman, how the jet engine works, how the different permutations of the jet engine there are, which roughly which planes they go in, in which we fly them, and why we do things with our jet engines in DCS um, and how they affect how we fly, and uh, should it clear a few things up. So we are going to cover a broad spectrum, the whole thing, but we're going to try and keep it, you know, concise and not drabble on too much, which is a problem for us because we do like to drabble on. So first of all, we're going to talk about why the jet engine exists in the first place. It obviously replaced the piston type engine with the uh, Spitfires and Mustangs and stuff of World War II. And the reason is that they realized that they were um, reaching the... Um, the end of what the piston engine can do and they needed new technology so this was the new technology and this was the technology that would push them through the sound barrier um, now the interesting about thing about the, uh, the the jet engine is how much power it can create per for its size and weight compared to uh, essentially anything else so it can be the same weight as say a piston spitfire engine it can produce i don't know how many times more power guys but 10 times more power or more, you know, huge amount of power they can create. And so they've been so successful. So first of all, uh, we're going to go into the basic physics and we're going to keep it really basic. And I'm going to turn it over to Blood to explain very roughly what the jet engine does. Excellent. So we're starting, we're going to start at the very core, the, the core basics of how this works. And as you can see on my diagram here, we have a magic box in the middle, which may or may not be replaced with a jet engine in a moment. Uh, but we first need to talk about this thing called momentum. So it's dead simple. It is just simply the mass of an object uh, times by its velocity is how much momentum it's got. Um, so velocity is subtly different to speed. So speed is like a car going at 30 miles an hour or you throw something at a certain speed or you're running. It's, uh, it's so fast. However, there's no direction associated with that. A car could be going 30 miles an hour or it's going north, east, south, west, etc. But velocity is a speed plus a direction. So in this case, if we go over to our left-hand side, we have this little, uh, little packet of air. And that has a velocity, uh, which we're calling V in, could be any, uh, any velocity, going from left to right. And it also has a mass associated with it, which is essentially just the amount of stuff that's there. And... What we're going to do is we're going to put that little packet of air through our magic box and out the other side it's going to be a bit faster. The mass is still the same because it's still the same object. Uh, we, we can't add or take away any mass but it's a bit faster. And this means that we have less momentum on the left hand side than we do on the right hand side. And this means we have had a change in this momentum. Now uh, our, our man Newton has told us that um, force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. So how quickly are we putting these little packets of air through our magic box and how much momentum has changed from left to right determines how much force we're going to get on our magic box. Now since our packet of air has got more momentum heading to the right then um, our magic box must have a force on it that is pointing forwards. And through another nice little equation that Mr. Newton gave us, force is equal to the mass, in this case the mass of our magic box, uh, times by acceleration. And that's what we're after, is we want to accelerate an object, in this case an aircraft, uh, to a higher speed. So all we're doing is we're taking slow air, moving it through the magic box, speeding it up, and because that air has mass, um, it's going to change its momentum and it's then going to impart a force on our magic box or aircraft and accelerate it forwards. Uh, but all we need to know now is how do we, how does this magic box work? How do we speed that air up? So we've talked about the rough physics of how it works. Now looking at the jet engine and the various permutations of the jet engine, 
So the uh, first thing is the pure turbojet, um, which comes in two different types. So we've got a, a, a rough diagram there. Don't worry about the intricacies so much of it yet. But um, what we can do, uh, why don't you talk us through the different stages of this uh, turbojet, actually, Recall? Yeah, no worries. So looking at the turbojet itself, you have air coming in, which is normally sucked in, or when you accelerate up to a certain speed, it's forced down the intake. So your compression stage is all about getting that airflow that's coming in packed down. So imagine you've got, imagine you've got a bottle of uh, a bottle, and you've screwed the top on, and you're just trying to squeeze it and squeeze it and squeeze it down. It's very hard to do, but that, that's what the compressor basically does. It squeezes a certain amount of air, smaller and smaller and smaller, makes it denser, until you reach, let me just get the pen, until you reach this point here, which is known as the diffuser. The diffuser is the highest point of static pressure. So as the air comes in, it's fast, but it's got a low static pressure. But as it gets through, it slows down, but it gets denser and denser, and the pressure, uh, the static pressure itself gets greater. Where that blue arrow is there, that's the highest point. So at that point, you're going to get the maximum efficiency out of the uh, out of the air. So it's where you've got the most energy. The combustor stage itself runs at around 2,000 degrees uh, Celsius. So it's a very, very hot uh, part of the engine. So the air is ignited, and it basically explodes inside, as every uh, ignition is. It basically explodes inside the combustion chamber and is then funneled onto your two-stage turbine. Two-stage turbine has a uh, is designed to get the maximum amount of energy out of the air. So the way it does that is it expands the air. So unlike the compressor stage where it compresses it down, the whole point of the turbine is to expand the air and get as much energy out of it as possible. This energy is then transferred into a thrust, normally a thrust mount, which would be attached about here. And so a lot of that force is actually driven into the airframe and is pushing the aircraft forwards. So a lot of people have the common misconception that the, an aircraft is powered by the hot exhaust gases coming out of the back end. That's not the case. We harness that air, which I'll come to later on. We harness that air for a little bit of extra oomph, but the majority of the force is channeled through the engine and pushed into the airframe itself. And that is what drives an aircraft forwards. Okay, uh, just a couple of kind of layman's questions. So as air comes through the um the compressors in this case a six stage compressor so that means just six yep. six fans doesn't it in a row yeah you have, you have six a stage made up of uh, a set of rotors so a blade that's turning and then you have a set of stators which is uh, stationary so the turning the turning uh, rotor increases the dynamic pressure and decreases the static pressure slightly but then the rotors increase the static pressure by slowing the air down so as you get further back it gradually slows it down but it increases the pressure of the air Right, okay, and as you can see, each kind of wheel gets a little bit smaller as it squeezes yes. more. Okay, and uh, so I'm guessing at the point then, um, I never thought about this, but just before you hit the combustors, um, mm -hmm. um, you must have a super high pressure. Um, now, doesn't that also mean it would have a super high temperature in that kind of charge inlet? Yeah, and, well, well it makes it more explodable, doesn't it? Yeah, well, as pressure, as pressure uh, increases, temperature also increases. But at the highest point of static pressure, so at the diffuser mm -hmm. point where you see the uh, the combustion chamber start to get bigger here, mm -hmm. where it starts to get bigger, go from small to big. That's mm -hmm. a, it's a relatively high temperature, but it's not as high as the uh, combustion chamber. Some of the air will go through into the combustion chamber into this this small area here uh, and ignite. But because the combustor is running at very high temperature, around two thousand degrees, it actually melt. Uh, in normal situations. So you have these little cooling holes oh, yeah. sitting here. And so air is drawn in mm -hmm. through these cooling holes and kind of goes flows around the outside. Uh, let me just get a blue thing. No, it's not blue. There we go. So air also flows around the outside here. Mm -hmm. and cools down the outside surface of the casing. Right. So a lot of this jet engine technology is about cooling, isn't it? Finding ways yeah, to cool. Yeah, it's, get, it's getting... The the limit of the amount of power an aircraft can produce is the amount of heat in which this turbine stage here mm. can withstand. Right. So if you can if you can make a turbine that can withstand higher temperatures, you can burn the combustion chamber hotter and get more more energy out of the uh, out of the uh, the ex the explosion that you're having. Roger that. 
and um, so the little things where the flamers are just before that they must be fuel injectors which must be essentially pipes from the fuel line i'm guessing yes so pipes in the fuel line uh, on on engine start you have igniters which are basically spark plugs yeah that's yeah uh, and they will they'll start they'll start cracking um, they're generally in the range of around 30 to 40,000 volts mm. of uh, energy in, a spark in the igniter sparks ignites the fuel and then once you have that you gradually increase the fuel as the start progresses until you reach uh, idle uh, and then the flame the en- the flame in the combustion chamber is self sustaining oh so you don't have the spark plugs going all the time then no so there are normally a couple of scenarios in which the spark plugs will uh, fire uh, the first case is on engine start uh, and they'll run up till the ignite will generally fire until the engine self sustaining so it doesn't need any assistance from any external starting such like an apu or a uh, like cartridges, that sort of thing. Hmm. Uh, or if you have uh, in some aircraft, if you're uh, if you have a flame out, your igniter will automatically start firing. Okay. So if the flame in the combustion chamber goes out, you want to get that back as quick as possible. Because hmm. the moment you lose, the moment you lose the flame in there, you're going to start losing power and you're going to fall out of the sky. So that's when the igniter will fire. So like for an engine relight, that sort of scenario. Uh, and then on fighter aircraft, uh, if they're firing off a gun or something, you can get. Uh, dirty air coming down the mm. intake and so the ignite will fire just in case that flame does go out right cool okay and just one more question about this before we move on um the uh the combustion chambers uh it's hard to see on this model but are there um are, are they like cans like you see on that the old ones or on modern fighters are they one big yeah. combustion cell i never really understood that yeah well is different uh different types of combustion chambers. So if you have a look at the first jet engine that Frank Whittle made, mm. uh, that's a cannula. Mm. Uh, it's a cannula combustion chamber. So it's kind of combustion chambers are all external and they're all set around in different points, kind of their own separate combustion chamber. This is uh, what you'd call annular construction. So everything uh, runs around uh, in the kind of those uh, tanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and are they separate tanks, or are they one big con- uh, donut type? Depends on, depends on the aircraft itself. Mm-hmm. So if you have a look on the uh, turbofan high bypass below, mm-hmm. that's a uh, that's kind of one big combustion cell. Mm-hmm. So you'd probably have like ten to ten to thirty uh, it kind of uh, nozzles, uh, spray jets for fuel. Mm-hmm. Got gotcha. so it. Right. It all it all depends on the aircraft design and what the designers had in mind when they created it and what they wanted it to do. Understood. Very good. Okay, so that was the turbojet. Now, if you can go to the picture below and just quickly explain the uh, difference with the turbofan. Don't worry about different types of turbofan yet, really, but what the difference is between the turbojet and the turbofan. So, the difference between a turbojet and a turbofan is all about efficiency. So, when they first created the engine, uh, they were turbojets uh, because they didn't really the principles weren't really around. They weren't, weren't really bothered about efficiency that much. But as uh, as time has progressed, uh, we've realised that we can use the uh, we can use the bypass air. So we'll we'll put most of the air through the compressor, and then a little bit of air will go around the outside of the combustion chamber uh, and around the compressor. And we'll use that at a later stage when it, in reheat. But I'll come to that later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the whole point is generally just to increase efficiency. You can, you'd have a lot of air going through the centre, but you have some as well as going around the outside, which you can use uh, later on for acceleration. And obviously, as you guys know, for efficiency, uh, airliners have a very high bypass uh, ratio, as you can see here. And so it enables them to produce a lot more thrust, but also to fly for much longer distances. Right. And so it's pretty... Uh, so one thing I think, I think we can say is that at least in the planes we fly, the old ones, like the Sabre and stuff, are uh, turbojet. I believe, yes. and the newer ones, even the fighters like the flankers and the eagles and stuff, will be turbo fan. Yep, because you want the power, but you also want a little bit of efficiency at the end of the day. Okay, that's fine. Uh, right, so the top type of turbojet is is the axial design. Um, I'm not sure why is it, why is it called axial. I guess that's just the name of it with the multi stage fans. Uh, generally, because the way the air works is it runs axially, oh, so it runs from front right. to back, whereas in a centrifugal down at the bottom, mm-hmm. it goes in and is flung outwards. So this, so this is the centrifugal type, and we've got, I think, one aircraft we fly, which is the MiG-15. I think that's all we've got, the centrifugal. So this was, um, I think these were possibly one of the first that came along. And so instead of uh, air going axially from left to right, it slings it out to the air edge. Is that right? Yep. So imagine spinning round on a uh, on a chair. If you uh, your legs always want to constantly kind of put go outwards, and that's what's happening with the air inside a centrifugal compressor. It's hitting the centre. And it's getting forced outwards by the turning motion of the compressor itself. 
or the impeller in this scenario. Mm -hmm. And these have been pretty much, I mean, they, uh, they started off like this, but they've been pretty much replaced, all of them now, by axial. So what was the major drawback of the centrifugal, or, ma or major two drawbacks? Uh, the major drawback of the centrifugal compressor was the fact that you, have, you suffer a thing called blade creep. So in turbofan engines, that sort of thing, it's still very, it's still a common occurrence due to obviously you're rotating something, you're rotating a blade around at very, very high speed. So as it gets hotter, it's going to stretch and elongate and it's going to wear down. The centrifugal compressor is generally a lot heavier. Uh, and that was one of the major, major disadvantages. It's a very heavy bit of equipment because you're normally a single stage compressor. Uh, or it says here, the impeller, you're going to get a very, you're going to get a single stage compressor. And you're not, you normally get a compression ratio about 10 to 1. And that's kind of the maximum you can get out of a centrifugal. Whereas you look at an axial flow compressor, you can get upwards of 20, 30 uh, to 1 compression ratio. So you get much more efficient. You get a much more efficient engine uh, and you get less of the weight uh, if you if you were to have a centrifugal engine of the same compression ratio. Understood. Cool. Okay, so we've looked at basic engines. Before we go on to intake and exhaust of the engine, we're going to quickly jump over to the right and look at the different types of, um, of of generation of, of of jet engine so at the top here we've got the basic turbojet that is what we've already described here then we've got the two turbo fans and if you'd like to quickly just quickly run through the high bypass and low bypass and their rough applications in that at least the type of planes that we might see yes so low bypass uh, turbo fans you'll normally find in fast jet aircraft where efficiency is needed, but not to the extent of civilian airliners. So you could harness, you could harness some of the bypass air for cooling and for afterburner. Uh, so you get a little bit more efficiency by moving slow, moving air around the outside and acceleration in the core. Uh, whereas high bypass turbofans for passenger liners, you you want to get a little bit of there through to burn in the middle, but the ma majority of you want to just push through around the outside to be able to fly longer distances and use less fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you're putting, what about an A10? Putting, what about an A10? That would have this, wouldn't it? Uh, unsure of the A10 engines, but I would imagine it would be a, a high bypass uh, engine due to obviously its speed, uh, because it's not, it's not really. It depends on the aircraft design, but it wasn't really designed to be a, obviously a faster interceptor. Right, we well know. Okay, cool. Uh, we've got turbo prop. I don't think we use this, but you can quickly do a description anyway. Yep. So turbo prop uh, is. Obviously, a propeller aircraft, but we use we made we made it more efficient. Instead of using pistons, we added a gas turbine into the back of it. This last blade here, right down here, will be a free normally be a freewheeling turbine. So the propeller itself and the last freewheeling turbine are interlinked. So the rest of it runs by itself. You can accelerate the engine to like 80, 90 percent, and that's how you control the thrust. The rear freewheeling freewheel turbine merely is using some of that uh, energy to turn the propeller at the front to go forwards. Okay. It's so an efficient method. It's basically a, a high-pass turbofan, but without the, the casing around the... Yeah, exactly. But obviously you have the limitation of propeller. So if you're looking for kind of low to medium level, long range, slow speed uh, kind of transports like a, C, uh, like a C-130 Hercules or like the A400M, that's yeah. going to have turbo prop. Oh, engine. Right. didn't know that. Cool. Or the, um, is it the Bear Bomber has, has bear, this, yeah. but with counter-rotating yeah. props, which is yes, con contra -rotating. phenomenally loud. Mm. Roger, yes. they're supersonic blades, aren't they? Uh, no. Oh, okay, fair enough. All right, that's... You, you, you go to a phenomena where you get supersonic tips, and that supersonic tip speeds, which is very bad for propeller. Right, okay, well, let's not get into that today. Uh, turbo shaft, so I'm guessing that is my Huey helicopter, is that right? No, any helicopter uh, will generally have a turbo shaft. So it'll run like a normal jet engine, uh, like a normal turbo jet engine, but then you'll also have a, uh, a gear gearing attached to it, which enables you to drive a rotor on the top. Right, and none of our jets use ramjet or turbo ramjet. Only, I think the only plane to ever use that may be corrected was the Blackbird, but just quickly go for it anyway. So ramjets you'll normally find in missiles. So for a ramjet to work, it has to have forward it has to have forward momentum. So it has to have, have to have air getting forced down because it doesn't have any blades of its own to uh, to accelerate the air. So you couldn't take off from from a runway with it. Basically, it has to. Start no, you couldn't fast. take off from a ramjet. So, like flying to fire a missile, you need forward moving uh, momentum to get air forcing down that ramjet, and then once it will ignite and go out of the back. Roger that. So normally, in missiles, generally. So, if it's not a solid state missile um, rocket, then it's going to be a, possibly a ramjet. 
So, uh, next we've just, so we've gone through the engine, then you have something on the front of the engine called an intake, which is an extremely, part, uh, extremely important part, especially if we're looking at supersonic planes, which is pretty much everything we fly. And then we've also got to look at the exhaust and how we can add power and how important the exhaust is. So first we're going to uh, look at the intakes. So um, uh, if we're looking at supersonic fighters, let's just go to the Eagle because it's just a, a typical supersonic fighter. It's going to have a low, pipe, low bypass ratio turbofan, that one there. And we're going to be dealing with it flying faster than, well, faster than Mach 2, so um, in, far in excess of supersonic speed. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that any jet engine cannot have air coming into the front of it beyond Mach 1. That's right, isn't it? Yes, the, op the most efficient speeds that an engine will operate at uh, in terms of uh, airflow coming into it is around Mach 0.4 to 0.5. Right. So around that speed, you have the max you get the max efficiency out of the engine. Any faster than that, efficiency will start to degrade. Uh, right. And the intake itself is designed to present the air to the compressor at that speed of Mach 0.4, right. 0.5. So we've got the problem now. We're flying our Eagle at Mach 2.5, 2.5 times the bad speed of sound, but the engine can't handle that. It needs it going about half a Mach. And just quickly, for my own information, if, if I did present air at Mach 2.5 into this engine, would it damage the rope, would it damage the blades, or...? You would, yeah, you'd, you'd wreck the engine. Interesting. Okay, so it's incredibly important that we, um, yeah, we, we change the airflow from um, uh, supersonic to subsonic uh, speed um, to the engine. So uh, there's there's three different types that we're interested in. There's a ramp type, as we might find on the F-15, for instance, and probably the flanker and stuff like that. I think they're they're similar. Well, you have an adjustable ramp, but we'll go through it in a second. A spike type, uh, we have that on our MiG-21, uh, where you have a spike that moves in and out, as you've probably seen. And then a conventional uh, design type. So I'm going to leave uh, record quickly, because this is an important subject, the intakes, and it will come on later on as well. Quickly go through the three types and how they work, please. Okay, so looking at the top, looking at the top you've got a variable geometry intake ramp. So what I've drawn here are shock waves. Okay, so on the intakes, uh, looking at the first one, you have a variable geometry intake ramp. You have two types of shock waves. So the first one is an oblique shock wave, which runs down at an angle. What this shock wave does is it slows air from higher supersonic speeds to a lower supersonic speed. So say the Eagle's flying at Mach 2.2, it will slow the air down from 2.2 to possibly 1.8. So it reduces uh, reduces it down slightly. In fact, I'll draw on here 2.2. So the air slows down slightly. Again, so that runs away from the lip of the intake to the bottom of the intake uh, between the two lips. And that's the way it's designed. So you normally find the top of the intake is very sharp and it's quite a uh, very thin top due to kind of the shockwave attaching uh, attaching onto it. Uh, on Coming up to the start of the ramp, you have another oblique shockwave which runs down and perhaps slow the air down from Mach 1.8 to Mach 1.3. Now coming up to this final shockwave here, it's called a normal shockwave. So what this will do is it will slow the air down from a supersonic speed to a subsonic speed. So slowing it down from Mach 1.3 down to say Mach 0.8. And so this is the way that a variable geometry intake ramp will slow the air down from high supersonic speeds slowing it down through to lower and lower supersonic speeds until eventually getting it down to subsonic. Roger. And then just going on from that normal shock wave, because it expands again, does that slow it down even further as a kind of diffuser? Yep. So as the uh, if you refer back to the uh, turbojet, just for the compressors, just for the combustion chamber, you have a diffuser, so a divergent duct, which slows the air down and increases static pressure. And all of this is designed to slow down the speed of the air, increases static pressure, optimizing for combustion. Roger. Excellent. If you now bl blast through the spike and the conventional type. Okay, so the spike, uh, the way it works, obviously, with its very sharp tip. From the tip itself, a shockwave runs down to the lip of the intake. Uh, so the outer lips of the spike will be sit in the center, looking at the mirage sits on the side uh, and the tip uh, extends and retracts depending on the aircraft speed uh, to slow it down. So this speed will run, say from let's go Mach 1.7, uh, the oblique shockwave running along will slow the air down to say Mach 1.2 and this is still too fast for the uh, too fast for the engine to accept. 
And so you have a normal shock wave which runs down at generally the kind of the, the sh closest point, uh, the kind of the smallest gap, and that will slow down the air to say, oh, that's not what I want. Let's go Mach 0.7, and then from there it will go down and uh, ink the intake will diverge and slow the air down uh, to Mach 0.4.5. And then finally, coming on to the conventional intake, I will just uh, redraw this. It will, the intake will normally run as such, so it runs from a smaller gap into a bigger gap. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're th these intakes are normally designed and optimized for speeds of about the maximum efficiency they can work at as a Mac Mac point uh, one point four to one point three. So that's what you're looking at. So you're going to have a shock wave running down here. You can have, say, Mach 1.4 or uh, Mach 1.3. That's kind of the upper range, uh, the upper range of the intake. And then you have a normal shock wave, which will slow the air down to, say, Mach 0.9. And so as as the air travels down and it gets wider and wider, static pressure will decrease. Uh, sorry, static pressure will increase and dynamic pressure, so velocity will decrease. And then it will present... Uh, air to the compressor stage the Mach 0.4 uh, to Mach to Mach 0.5 uh, so there you got your compressor stages running down and so that's the way a conventional intake will do uh, will work right okay so just to summarize that we've got a conventional type uh, like we saw I think the Jaguar is our example um, which is good because it's simple and simple is good and simple is light but it means you can only go up to about Mach 0.4 roughly before it will no longer do its job well enough. Um, if you want to go real fast, like an Eagle or a MiG-21, then you've got to have um, an adjustable element, or so an adjustable spike as one type, or the adjustable ramp. And one thing I've learned today, though, then, is so that, for instance, if this adjustable ramp in the F-15 fails, say the hydraulics fail or whatever runs it, and if it, if it doesn't do its job, then that air could come in at Mach 2.2 and kill the engine, couldn't it? If one of the ramps fail, yeah. I wasn't aware of uh, that. The ramp, the ramp will generally fail in its position, and so the pilot will be made aware of this and will slow the aircraft down. Uh, and we'll normally have some method of opening that ramp back up when he reaches a lower speed. Roger. So the ramp, if hydraulics fail, it's not going to suddenly open up and it's going to destroy the engine. Yeah. It will generally freeze where it is. Sure. Uh, the aircraft designers will have taken this into account and gone, right, okay, if this happens, we'll do this. Uh, the intake, the ramp will do this, and then the pilot will be made aware of it and you can get to a speed in which it's safe for the aircraft. Roger that. Uh, right, so now we're pushing ourselves into the later stages of the, of the jet engine. So when was afterburners introduced? That must be 60s, afterburners? Early 60s? Uh, late 50s? I'm, I'm not entirely sure when it was introduced. Uh, okay. The purpose, purpose and the principle, the way reheat works. Uh, so afterburner, so it's after the combustion stage or reheat uh, comes from reheating the exhaust gases. Roger, let me just quickly point it out on my picture here. So to... So the, the engine uh, in the olden days used to end there where my mouse cursor is. Later on we added this big whopping great jet pipe and this little rectangle um, uh, uh, is representing our afterburner injector. Um, and after that a nozzle we'll talk about. But if you want to go uh, just kind of about the afterburner and the jet pipe, why it was introduced and what it does. Okay, so as we all know the speed of sound uh, is around 620 miles per hour at sea level. So the way reheat works is the whole purpose is to increase the speed of the air. So at the nozzle here, where that blue line is, uh, the air exits the nozzle at Mach 1. So it's uh, a term that's derived, uh, known as choked. So the exhaust is running choked. So the jet pipe uh, itself at the nozzle where that blue line is operates choked. So that speed is Mach 1. So say so the, uh, the exhaust runs at a certain temperature. Say so that temperature is... Uh, 700 degrees and the airflow coming out is 600 miles an hour say that Mach 1 will be 600 miles an hour and won't uh, won't change uh, obviously depending if the engine gets hotter or not the way reheat is designed to work is to increase that temperature so instead of the air so instead of the air running Mach 1 and coming out at like 7 800 degree 7 800 miles an hour the air is going to be coming out at over 2000 miles an hour wow so it's still going to be operating at Mach 1. The the the, uh, the, engine, the nozzle is going to operate choked at Mach 1, but that Mach 1 is substantially faster because, due to it being hotter. Right, so the, the speed of sound 
is incre increasing because of the extra heat of the yes. gas. I didn't know that. Interesting. Yep. So the way the way you accelerate an aircraft faster is by reheating and thus increasing the speed of sound. So the the speed of the uh, flames come out of the back, the exhaust coming out of the back is like over two thousand miles an hour compared mm -hmm. to say like eight nine hundred miles an hour. Cool. Okay, and the purpose of this, essentially, at the end of the day, is to add more power, isn't it? It's to add more force to transfer our linkage at the front to yep. uh, to do that. That's fine. And um, so it, the ultimate comes from this uh, the rectangle, and that is a ring of fuel injectors. And as far as I'm aware, the afterburner is literally just a bunch of ring in, uh, injectors and spark plugs or something along those lines, is it not? You will have three methods of uh, igniting the reheat. So the first one is... Uh, a standard igniter plug, so like a, a spark. Uh, the second one that the Jaguar had was uh, a catalyst. So as the fuel flowed over that, it uh, got it to a got it to a condition that it was able to combust uh, basically very quickly. Uh, and the third one, and the most common method, is a thing called hot shot. So what it does is it fires a small amount of fuel, probably around two to three hundred milliliters of fuel. So not a great deal into the combustion chamber. So at this point, you've got fuel flowing into your uh, reheat section in your jet pipe. That jet of fuel that gets sprayed into the combustion chamber will streak through. It's only a very, it's only a very, very, very short flash. So lasts for maybe 0.2 to 0.4 of a second. So it's a very quick flame. It's not going to do any damage to the rear turbine. That, that jet of flame will streak through the, uh, through the turbine section and into the uh, into the flame holders or into the reheat section, and then we'll create your uh, your fire. Mm, gotcha. Right. Okay. And um, and so, like we said, this is uh, significantly add power. And when you're looking at it, looking at our airplanes flying, when the flame comes out the back, the afterburner, that's what we're talking about. That's reheat, and that's really so. It's almost you could say it almost doubles the power of the engine. It's significant power increase. Yes, it's, it wouldn't double the power of the engine, uh, but it would give you uh, more thrust, which is uh, it's very, very handy to have, especially in a combat aircraft. But the downside is it uses a lot more fuel right. compared to standard dry thrust. Roger, so we'll yeah. talk about efficiency soon. Okay, that's fine. Um, just before we uh, end the jet, and this jet pipe obviously gets extremely hot. You've got this uh, 2,000 degrees that we were talking about. Um, and it's my understanding that, say, we go back to our Eagle, it has a low bypass uh, ratio turbofan, so you're going to have lovely cold air bypassing the engine where my cursor's going, and I believe that's going to be used to cool that jet pipe, because yep. otherwise it would melt. Yeah, it's going to be used to cool it, but it's also going to be a lot of fresh air and fresh oxygen for the afterburner section to use. So you've got, so as it goes to the combustion chamber, it uses up a large amount of oxygen, and then when you reheat it, you've only got a certain amount mm -hmm. to use. The whole point of a low bypass is you have that extra fresh oxygen that hasn't only been used up mm -hmm. straight into the uh, straight into the jet pipe. It gives it a, gives it a much stronger flame, and much more power. Roger well, that. Excellent. So we talked about how the afterburner works and what it does. And finally, before we leave this uh, technical section, can you explain um, the exhaust? Um, it's not just you know the engine doesn't it doesn't just end. We have an adjustable. Exhaust, can you talk us through that and why it has different settings at different, you know? Yep, so at idle, the nozzle, uh, the exhaust is generally open because you don't want to get, you don't want to utilize any of the thrust. So you're sitting there on the ground, you don't want to go anywhere. The nozzle is going to be wide open. Uh, so in this case, it's going to be basically flat. Uh, so it's going to go out, you're not going to get uh, much, much force out of it. When you're about to taxi, uh, when you throttle up, say, max dry, the nozzles will then kink in and create a smaller uh, smaller uh, area so it's also known as the aj so the area of the jet pipe so the aj will decrease and then you'll get an increase of pressure felt here and also you can utilize some of the exhaust gases coming out for a bit more thrust and that's basically the whole purpose of the nozzle so in the airflow out the back is to utilize it to get a little get the last little bit of energy out of the exhaust you can before it leaves the jet pipe and then, and then yep. looking at the condi nozzle, so as you see here, it's a convergent, divergent nozzle. So it goes in and then goes out. The whole point of this, uh, the way a intake works, it's basically an intake, uh, is to increase the air from Mach 1. So here it's Mach 1. It'll increase the air 
to a higher supersonic speed. So instead of reaching Mach 1, uh, go up to the top one here, instead of going to Mach 1 and then slowing down to, say, Mach 0.6 uh, as it diffuses out, the way a supersonic uh, nozzle works is works in the opposite direction. So it utilizes, uh, I'm not going to go into it, but it, the way it works is it increases the speed of the air. Right. So you can get like Mach 1.4 out of it right so when you get to much more uh, much more powerful engines and much more efficient engines so you're looking at the f-22 it can super cruise because it has a convergent divergent nozzle so it increases the air from a supersonic speed to a higher supersonic speed right and so for what people care about so when you see our f-15 or whatever rolling about on the runway uh, with very low throttle they'll be open and we can see a picture on the right here just to show you how complicated these bloody things are um well, they'll be open like this, a nice big hole, because we don't want to optimize that thrust because we don't want thrust at that point. Then when we go to take off, and um, if we want to take off without our afterburners because we're saving fuel, we want to maximize the amount of thrust coming out. So these will squeeze into a tiny hole, wouldn't they? And reduce the AJ, as you said. And then um, if we're up um, fighting and we see a bad guy, we want to turn our afterburners on, they'll open up again, won't they? Yes, they'll open up. So because they can't, I'm guessing they can't handle being small when the afterburner's on. Yeah, you have you have a build when the preheat uh, engages. You have a build of a pressure inside the jet pipe, and the last thing you want to do is to slow down the main engines at the core engine. You don't want to slow that down because when you start slowing that down, you're going to start getting a lot of you're going to get stalls and surges. That's what I think. So the air is going to start pushing back the other way through the compressor, and it's not designed to go from back to front it's designed to go from front to back so the nozzle will open up to relieve that pressure and enable the uh, engine to continue running unaffected great okay so that explains the different nozzle sizes on that aircraft that you can see and what what they're doing uh just this is a cool little picture i wanted to bring this up so we're looking at a jet engine here here's the front uh here's the compressor stage probably somewhere around here is the uh combustion doesn't really matter but all i wanted to point out was that you can have adjustable um kind of compression section so we've got a um, a multi-stage compressor section here you can see one two three four five six something like that and we've got some gear linkages here to adjust and it doesn't actually adjust the um if we go over here it doesn't adjust the the turning fans doesn't it it just no, it adjusts the status which is what we're looking at here they're between the fans they're adjustable like fins if you like um, which allow you to give some ad ad adjustment um i guess we don't really want to go into that unless you want yeah, to well, the, en the engines the, so this engine is designed to run on the store margin. So you want the, the, you want to get the maximum efficiency by running as close to the store margin as you can. So with like an aerofoil where the compressor blades are going to stall. So at low starting speeds, you want to you want to increase that store margin because you don't want you don't want to stall or surge on start because it's going to be very bad for the engine and you're going to damage things a lot. So the adjustable states are designed on start to swirl the air in a way that uh, reduces the loading on the blades until it gets faster and faster and then they'll start to close up oh, sorry start to open and you will uh, they'll run as normal right so, yep sorry anything else no it's, it's just it's generally just designed for uh, starting starting in different engine settings to maximize the efficiency of the blades super duper so um what let's quickly talk about uh, efficiency what you'd call a kind of my gas mileage in a car uh, so efficiency in an aircraft is extremely important when we're going out on our missions uh, mainly what we uh, what we can do in our aircraft is affected by how much fuel or gas we've got in the in the plane and how efficient we can be with it and that's part of our kind of training and, and, and what we do as virtual pilots um, we have to figure out how to get as much efficiency out of our engines as possible you want to use for the particular part of the mission there will be different parts requiring different amounts of speed you want to use as little thrust as you can to get away with doing that part of the mission that's right isn't yeah, it you, you want, want to, to use, use as little, little fuel mm -hmm. so what you can generally do for that is climb uh, to altitude mm -hmm. so the engine will use less air because there's less resistance so it's, the engine is easy to turn so it will use less fuel to get the same thrust output yeah, so uh, so you cl you'll climb to say twenty thirty thousand feet to use less fuel, get more efficiency out of the engine, or you can reduce throttle setting, fly at a slower speed to get the same kind of uh, performance gotcha. at so, uh, low level. So if we wanted to do a whopping great five hundred miles, and we our aeroplane was heavily loaded with with uh, you know whatever ordnance and stuff, 
we could fly 50% throttle, uh, just, just an example, low to the ground, or we could fly 50% throttle up at 30,000 feet, and we would essentially do the same job, but we would burn off much less fuel at 37,000 yes. feet because of the thin air and therefore the uh, less amount of fuel used. So if we want to basically make our engine as efficient as possible for that task, we want to go high and use as little throttle as possible. Yep. Now, that said, um, when the proverbial poo hits the fan and we get into trouble, we are going to have to uh, up our power and either be at full, what we call full military power, which means the maximum, is that the maximum dry thrust? Yes, maximum uh, so, so, which means the maximum thrust without using the afterburner. Um, or we may have to go into full reheat or full afterburner, at which point the uh, uh, engine becomes extremely inefficient because we are burning vast amounts of, of fuel off. Yep, so instead of like a... Uh Instead of like someone spraying a little hose pipe and you're getting a little amount of fuel, someone's opened up the dam and it's come flooding through. That's basically what reheat is. You're just chucking raw fuel in the back to get a really big bang and to go faster. So, so what I'm trying to say is that is you, we don't want to fly around with reheating all the time because it looks cool. We'll only use it when we absolutely need it. Like if we've got a short runway and we need to do an afterburner takeoff, we'll do that. If a hostile is aggressing, and we've got to in our you know in our training we've got to get fast for whatever reason we have to use it but we only use it when we absolutely have to we'll never use it for fun uh, and that's because of uh, engine efficiency and fuel fuel usage yeah there's there's also the other question of why not just have a, a much bigger engine instead of having this reheat and it's because reheat is a very good it doesn't weigh very much to add it to an engine it's very lightweight because all it is is just adding uh, just uh, some fuel pipes to the exhaust and pumping some fuel in. And it means that, as you say, we can have we don't have to lug around a big engine when we want to fly really efficiently. Uh, but when we want that extra power, we can just turn it on. And but of course, that lack of weight comes at the cost of extra fuel consumption. Uh, and another thing that so that affects us so that 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 is why we use different engine settings for different parts of the mission. Um, now, uh, we're going to talk about uh, engine stalling, which can happen, and has happened in many of our missions, and will happen in many more of our missions. It's where, essentially, um, well, you essentially kill the engine off, um, but I will I don't really understand it, so I'll let the boys explain engine stall. So, engine stalling is often accompanied with surge. It's generally what happens when you have too much air coming down the uh, compressor stages for the uh, for the engine to cope so imagine you're eating a uh, eating a sandwich everything's fine you're happily munching away someone starts ramming that sandwich down your throat you're going to start choking you're not going to be able to kind of process it properly so that's basically what a stall or a surge is you're getting too much air coming down the intake for the engine to to handle and so what will happen is it will start to stall so the blades uh, like an aeroplane will not operate efficiently they'll stall and then the air will start surging so that's when the air starts moving backwards and forwards inside the compressor uh, which is very bad because you want it to go from front to back when it starts going back to front things start to happen and it becomes uh, a very dangerous a very dangerous situation so the way you counter that is to reduce throttle or reduce speed uh, to stop that engine from uh, stalling and surging Right, so that a good example of that is I think the MiG-21, if you go too fast, slow down, it, it will yes. surge. Um, now, so the intake will run at a certain speed and then it'll get to that point and you'll start it starts ramming the air down the engine's like, well, I can't handle this and start stalling. So how about then when I stalled the other day on the Vigan, I was I was going actually very slow, only kind of 250 knots, but I was pulling a high alpha, a high angle of attack, and that stalled. So if anything, that's the opposite way around, isn't it? Yep, so that's... Uh, that's similar to an airfoil again, you're getting low airflow, the blades will stall. It's exactly the same thing. You're pulling high alpha, the air's coming across in a way that not a lot of it's going down the engine. Yeah. And the engine needs a certain amount of air to run a, run properly, and when it doesn't have that, it kind of goes like you can't when you run out of fuel, it goes pep, pep, starts coughing, and can't, uh, can't run. So that's what happens when uh, you pull high alpha. So it can happen at high speeds, too much air coming down, or you can have too little air. Right, okay, so just showing the people at home, so the air wants to come in like that, a lovely laminar um, a flow like that, but if we're putting high alpha in our Vigan, it's coming in all of a sudden like that, and the intake just isn't really designed to handle that, and so not enough air is getting into the engine, and then it will stall. So if we look back at the F-15, you've got, I think, a, a, a nozzle that can actually point down when you're pulling high alpha, haven't you, to, to help out that situation. So you can, put, you can pull a super high alpha. Okay, that's good. 
And the last thing is improvements. Engines are constantly improving um, over the years, I guess, because of better metals that are being, or just materials in general that are being, yep. example, and t manufacturing techniques, and flow modeling, and stuff like that. Um, so I think uh, a good example of that is aircraft that are in service for a long time, like the F-15 Eagle. The original engines, I think I may get this wrong, so burn me if you will, but I think the original engines were the Pratt & Whitney and the F-15 Charlie, which uh, made a wet thrust afterburner of about 25,000 pounds thereabouts, and they're being replaced by new engines or newer engines. I think the General, General Electric's the same size, the same weight, more or less, as far as I'm aware. Look the, pretty much the same. But they produce um, uh, another ten thousand pounds of thrust. So instead of twenty five thousand, it's I think it's up to nearly thirty five thousand pounds of thrust, something along those lines. So that shows how modern um, advances in engines into older planes. Yep, it's it's all due to new metals coming out, and so you can create a turbine that can withstand higher temperatures. The higher the temperature the turbine can withstand, the more power you can get out of the engine. So compared to the Pratt and Whitney's, uh, you say. Compared to General Electric's, they've created uh, they've created ways of being making the turbines run at a higher temperature, and so extracts more power out of the engine. Beautiful. Okay. Um, I hope we've done our job in explaining as thoroughly as we can, within reason, how the engine works, the different PM mutations, and the things that affect us when we're flying about, the things that we're always thinking about when we're flying our mission. 